Good morning and welcome to Christ Church on this second Sunday after Epiphany as we gather around our Lord's table to celebrate the Holy Eucharist. We will be celebrating today without music as uh, Bruno, our director of music, called this morning and said he was feeling unwell and didn't want to play fast and loose with other people's health. And so he has opted to stay home today in order to keep others safe. We acknowledge that we are in the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Anishinaabe people on whose land and by whose water we gather to worship, listen, learn, share, and heal together. In the name of our Creator, the Holy One of Blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world. May your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, shine the radiance of his glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us hear God's word to us in Holy Scripture. A reading from the book of Isaiah. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall, shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory, and you should be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you should be called, My delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your builder marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 36, verses 5 to 10. We'll say the psalm together. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens, and your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the strong mountains, your justice like the great deep. You save both man and beast, O Lord. How priceless is your love, O God. Your people take refuge under the shadow of your wings. They feast upon the abundance of your house. You give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the well of life, and in your life we see life. Continue your loving kindness 
to those who know you, and your favor to those who are few of heart. The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each one holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. May only the truth be spoken here, and may only the truth be heard. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I imagine that when I was in elementary school, I was likely one of those students who drove teachers absolutely mad. As soon as they would answer my question, the knee-jerk reaction was, but why? Always more and more questions. When I got to seminary, there was a great professor there who gave that a title and turned it into a virtue. She called it the critical hermeneutic, the need to always ask the next logical question as soon as we've got an answer to the last one. Well, this gospel this week really brought my critical hermeneutic to the surface, and even more so after we had met on Tuesday for Bible study. First of all, John is the only gospel who tells us the story of this wedding feast in Cana. John has no telling of the baptism of Jesus or any of those things. For John, this is the moment we come to see Jesus as Messiah. And so my first question was, why does John choose to tell this story as the beginning of the Book of Miracles. You see, John is made up of three different collections. The first, chapter 1, is known as the prologue. From chapters 19 to the end of the book is John's telling of the passion. In between is the part that biblical scholars call the Book of Miracles. And whenever John tells a miracle in his gospel, he then spends about a chapter teaching, helping us to understand what that miracle is all about. And then usually ends that chapter with Jesus making an I am statement. I am the bread of life. I am the light. Claiming I am the name of God and then helping us to understand the miracle in the light of the nature and the love of God. None of those marks of a miracle story are here in the telling of the, the wedding at Cana of Galilee. And in fact, John very specifically doesn't call this one a miracle. This one is a sign. 
This is the first of the signs in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory and his disciples believed. A sign is much different from a miracle. A sign, just as a road sign that we encounter every day, is meant to get us to raise our eyes up to the horizon and look for something that's coming ahead of us. And so John, in telling this sign, is inviting us to look ahead, to see the coming kingdom, and to prepare ourselves for it. All of the other miracle stories in John address the very height of human need. The miracles that will happen in John's gospel. Jesus will feed multitudes of people. He will deal with human hunger. He will heal the sick. Give sight to the blind. Raise a dead man. And drive out the powers of evil that keep people enslaved. And yet here, he deals with what seems like just a minor nuisance situation. He and his mom and his disciples are at a wedding in Cana. And in a small village like Cana, everyone would have been invited to the, to the wedding feast. Everyone there. And this one has gone even further because Jesus' mother and his disciples and Jesus himself have been invited to this wedding. This sudden encroachment of scarcity would have been a great embarrassment for the bridegroom. As a sign, the first thing John wants us to see here is that movement from scarcity to abundance. Jesus here has the servants fill six water jars each holding 20 to 30 gallons, and transforms all of that into wine. Between 150 and 180 gallons of wine. No longer scarcity, but abundance. Riches beyond belief. So as we look off to the horizon and we look to that kingdom of God, it's about abundance. It's about abundance too big to even really comprehend. And the steward says, everybody else serves the good wine first and keeps the, the lesser stuff for later, but you have provided the best. Well, again, the abundance of what Jesus offers to us is that it's not just lots of it, but it's of the very best quality. The kingdom is an invitation to us to come to a party, to come and experience God's grace and God's love that is full to overflowing. Years ago, I had a colleague who was doing an interim ministry just on the outskirts of London in a lovely, smaller parish. And he knew that the gospel reading where J Jesus says, I came that you might have life and have it in abundance was coming up. And so for a couple weeks ahead, he had a video camera pointed out onto the congregation and recorded them in their worship. And after the two weeks, he clipped together some small bits of that recording. And on the Sunday of abundant life, he set a television on the chancel steps and invited to watch them to watch themselves in worship. And afterwards, he said, I came that you might have life and might have it in abundance. And folks, if that's abundant living, I want none of it. Because the camera had caught dour, joyless looks on people's faces. This kingdom we're invited to is a kingdom of joy and celebration in abundance. But there were other questions that came up for me as we went through this. One person at the Bible study said to me, what do you make of what seems like a Eucharistic image in this reading? And that sent me back, and I spent the whole week looking back at that Eucharistic image. 
And I thought it goes further in both directions than just the Eucharistic. These water jars, it tells us, are for the rites of purification. And in the 600-odd laws of the Torah, a lot of them have to do with slavishly following rules about how to wash yourself and other things in order to prevent being made unclean. And this, this slavish adherence to the law, is what Jesus takes and transforms into the wine of joy, of partying, of celebration. But we know that 18 chapters later, he's going to take that same wine and he's going to transform it again. And that wine will become his blood by which he demonstrates the incredible love that God has for us. But I said it goes further than the Eucharistic image in both directions. In this direction, we remember that at the offering, each time we gather in worship, there are three gifts that we set on the table. We set the gifts of bread and wine. And we set the gift of our money on the table. The bread and wine, of course, we expect that God is going to transform into his body and blood in order to feed us for the journey that lies ahead for us in following in Jesus' footsteps. The money is another symbol. We place that offering on the table, and that offering is symbolically us. It represents the things that we do in our lives the other six days of the week. And when we place that offering on the table, we are also praying that God would transform us, that God would take our ordinary lives and would make us into the ministers that God needs us to be in the world out there. Why are we needed as ministers in the world out there? But to share that joy and abundance of a kingdom filled with enough love and grace for all. As I thought about that joy and abundance that we've been promised here, I noticed there's nothing in this story that speaks about a life without trouble. What it speaks about is that there will be abundance of joy and love and grace to help us to get through the troubles that come into our life each day, each week. And so we gather once again at the table today and we will bring our offerings of bread and wine and ourselves and let us remember and prayerfully ask God to transform, to transform those hosts into his body and blood, to feed us for the work we have ahead of us, and to transform us, to be the ministers that God needs for our world today. Amen. Let us stand now and confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Let us prepare 
for prayer by taking a few deep breaths to focus more deeply on this time with God. In faith and with hope, let us pray to God, saying the response, Lord, hear our prayer. In the Anglican cycle, we pray for the Church of England. In our diocesan cycle, we pray for the Scarborough Deanery. In our outreach cycle, we pray for the parish of Craighurst and Midhurst, with its support of the Berry and Elmdale Food Banks, Youth Haven and Women's Shelters, and the Christmas outreach to local families. We pray for our Canadian primate, Linda, and for Father Don. And we remember Pat Laidlaw and her ministry with Noah's Ark. For all clergy and laity, and for all whom we serve in ministry, let us pray. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. prayer. For all those in constitutional positions of responsibility, our Queen Elizabeth, our Governor General Mary Simon, and our Lieutenant Governor General Elizabeth Dowdswell. In our community, we remember our Allen Drive property with its board of directors, property managers, tenants, and clients, that all may exercise wisdom in their execution of their duties. Let us pray, Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray for those who are sick and suffering in mind, body, or spirit. I invite you to pray silently or aloud for those who have asked for our prayers. You may refer to the list on our website or the back of our leaflet. We also pray for others who are on our minds and in our hearts. At this time, we remember Gary and Marg. Susan, Charlene, Sandra, Vera, Teresa Lavender, Mary, Shona, Carol Ohlers, Mike Busick, David and Lisa, Frank, Leslie and John, Diane and her family, Margaret, Laura, Marilyn Cowell and the Cowell family, Bill and Dorothy, Kara Lowry and her parents, Jesse and Shauna. Pat. Darlene and her family. Pierce. And Andrina's family and friends. For their safety, health, consolation, and salvation, let us pray. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. God, you have given us grace at this time to make our prayers known to you. You have promised through Jesus that when two or three are gathered, you will hear our requests. Fulfill our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world the knowledge of your truth and in the age to come eternal life. For you, God, are good and loving. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. God welcomes sinners and invites them to the table. Let us confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. 
most merciful God. We confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God loves us. God forgives us. The peace of the Lord be always. Living God, you have revealed your Son as the Messiah. May we hear his word and follow it and live as children of light. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right that we should praise you, gracious God, for you created all things. You formed us in your own image. Male and female, you created us. When we turned away from you in sin, you did not cease to care for us, but opened a path of salvation for all people. You made a covenant with Israel, and through your servants Abraham and Sarah, gave the promise of a blessing to all nations. Through Moses, you led your people from bondage into freedom. Through the prophets, you renewed your promise of salvation. Therefore, with them and with all your saints who have served you in every age, we give thanks and raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy God, source of life and goodness, all creation rightly gives you praise. In the fullness of time, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to share our human nature 
to live and to die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He healed the sick and ate and drank with outcasts and sinners. He opened the eyes of the blind and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and to those in need. In all things, he fulfilled your gracious will. On the night he freely gave himself to death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Gracious God, his perfect sacrifice destroys the power of sin and death. By raising him to life, you give us life forevermore. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Recalling his death, proclaiming his resurrection, and looking for his coming again in glory, we offer you, Father, this bread and this cup. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts that all who eat and drink at this table may be one body and one holy people, a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. So as our Savior Christ has taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. I am the bread of life, says the Lord. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who trust in him. These are the gifts of God, and they are for you, who are the people.
let us pray. God of glory, you nourish us with bread from heaven. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, that through us your light may shine in all the world. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus ever and ever. Amen. In the way of announcements, I have two announcements that I'd like to flag, and then I'd like to take just a moment, a teaching moment. So, uh, first of all, we had our first Zoom Bible study on Tuesday at 11. It was a great success with about 11 or 12 people present. I'd like to invite more people to come and be a part of that. Uh, it's easy from your, the comfort of your very own home. Um, the Zoom link is available on your uh, weekly newsletter. And what we do is get together, we begin with a bit of Lectio Divina, an opportunity to hear the scripture a couple of times, and then to pick those words or images or thoughts that really captured our imagination, and then we start to delve into them. And uh, for me, it's great as, as a preparation for preaching, because I get to hear some different perspectives on what was important in this community about that story. As well, on Friday at 11, we have another Zoom gathering, which I'm just calling a Zoom coffee hour. You provide the coffee. Make your cup of coffee, come and join us online, and we will just have a chat and fellowship. We again started this week, and although it was a very small gathering, it was great. And I see it as very helpful to me as well as being helpful to offer our congregation fellowship because when I landed here on the 1st of November, I had a very short term before we ended up closed again. And it robbed me of the opportunity to get to know you and who you really are. And so I'm open, making it open season. If you want to come and join for coffee hour, you can feel free to ask me any question you'd like just an opportunity for us to get to know one another and grow in that relationship that priesthood and congregation is supposed to be all about, even while we're struggling again with the constraints of COVID restrictions. So please feel free to join us. And the last thing I always believe, symbolism that doesn't get explained is wasted. And so today as I put on my vestments, I thought, I wonder, how many people have ever seen one of these in use? They went out of popular use likely more than a century ago, but I love the symbolism of it, and so I had them made to match my vestments. They're called a manifold. It looks like a tiny soul over the left wrist. I don't have a very good group of people to pick on for answers here, but where else might you see someone with a swath of cloth over their left arm? A waiter, exactly, and that's the root of this, is that it is a reminder as we put it on that our primary call is to be a servant. In the time of Jesus, of course, being a server at table was almost the lowest position a person could hold. And we can sometimes, as we're put up in leadership positions within the church, start to do exactly what Jesus tells us not to, to lord it over others. And this, for me, is a weekly reminder that the first thing I'm called to be is a servant. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be amongst you and remain with you and with all those whom you love, all those whom you serve this day and forever.